Good evening and welcome to this series of critical conversations here at the Houston Public Library. On behalf of our director, Dr. Rhea Lawson, I want to welcome you all uh, to this particular evening uh, with our great and good friend, Dr. Stephen Kleinberg. Uh, we're all in for a treat. And those of you who have heard him and, and know of his work uh, will be able to attest to that. Those of you who maybe for the first time will be hearing him, uh, you will really enjoy uh, this presentation. Uh, we're going to have a presentation by Doc, uh, Dr. Kleinberg. I then will engage uh, in Q&A with him uh, and have a little dialogue that he and I have kind of talked about that we want to go over some issues. And then we're going to open it up to you, our guest, uh, via the chat uh, for your questions. So without, without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Kleinberg and we will start. Dr. Stephen Kleinberg is a demographics expert and sociologist. He is the founder of the Kinder Institute for Urban Research. Professor Emeritus of, of Sociology at Rice University. He is the author of Prophetic City, Houston on the Cusp of a Changing America. Dr. Kleinberg has also been the architect and the author and the director of the Houston Area Annual Survey, now in his 41st year since 1982, the longest running continuous survey of any city in America as to the trends of, of the population of the citizens. It is really a great tool and a great gem that we have in our city, this survey, to be able to utilize. The Houston Chronicle recently named him Houston's prophet, and that he is. Uh, he is our beloved, breathless, wonder, data evangelist, irrepressible foundation of hope. Uh, these are all the words from the Chronicle article, by the way. Uh, and he really has lived up to that all these years. I am proud to call Dr. Kleinberg my friend. Uh, we're probably in our own 35th year somewhere in there uh, of working and knowing each other. Uh, he and I used to always tease that uh, when he made his presentation of the survey, uh, it used to be in the old days, it was done with overheads, with transparencies. So I got to, to uh, be with him many times. So I started carrying extra light bulbs with the transparency machine because he went out once or twice when he was doing it and nobody had one. So I just started carrying them with me. Uh, and also had an extra copy of his transparencies in my briefcase uh, in case some of his got damaged or lost. Uh, so we ended up being a great team there for a while in the old world of transparency. I had a, I had a kid, I mentioned that too, uh, at the luncheon, Dr. Kleinberg at the uh, recent Kinder Institute. He said, transparency, what, what what's that? What is, anyway, that just goes to show you how things have changed. Uh, without further ado, welcome and good evening, and so glad to have you, Dr. Stephen Kleinberg. Well, thank you, Larry. It's just great to be here. And and you're right, we go back a long ways with with both of us loving the city and concerned about how it's how it's developing and what its what its future holds. And so the surveys have sort of given us a picture of who we are and how we've been changing over these years. I, I tell people we take well, we take a representative random sample of Harris County residents reached by random telephone numbers. Now, now done through through the web web design and 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 uh, not not uh, tell no one answers the telephone anymore. So so it's it's done by 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 uh, web web access and it's a representative random sample of Harris County residents asking people that identical questions over the years. How do you see the world? What is happening in your life? And we have watched the world change. Houston went into major recession with the collapse of the oil boom. There used to be good blue collar jobs. You could drop out of high school with a strong right arm and the willingness to work hard. You could uh, become a rust about the oil fields. You could you could work for, for, for uh, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, the big, big oil field manufacturing uh, businesses of Hughes Tool Company, Cameron Iron Works, and you could get a good job and support a family. Increasingly growing inequalities in Houston predicated above all else on access to quality education. Secondly, this remarkable, fundamental, irreversible transformation in the ethnic composition of the Houston, the Texas, and the American population. This, this Houston throughout all of its history was a biracial Southern city dominated and controlled by white men, now becoming the most ethnically diverse city in the, in the country. All the growth of Houston during the last 40 years has been the influx of African-Americans, Latinos, and Asians. And this biracial Southern city has become, by, by some measures, the single most ethnically diverse city in the country. And, and Houston was world famous in the old days when we were riding the oil boom 
of, of, of putting the minimum amount of controls on development of any city in the Western world. Who cares if it's ugly? So what if it smells? It's a smell of money. Come on down. Now recognizing if Houston's going to make it in the 21st century, it has to become a destination of choice, a place where the best and the brightest people in America working the cutting edge of knowledge will say, I want to live in Houston, Texas. And we've been making all kinds of improvements in quality of life in the city. So it's those three great themes. A new economy of growing inequalities predicated above all else on access to quality education. A, a celebration largely of this demographic revolution that has transformed Houston and Texas and America in the 21st century. By 2050, all of America will look like Houston looks today. We are there first. This is where the American future is being worked out. And a, 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 a new global economy needing to attract the best and the brightest people in America able to put that their knowledge into commercial ventures who can live anywhere will they want to come to Houston, Texas. And so quality of life issues have, been, have become at the forefront and there's a whole new sort of agenda that Houston faces as it as it thinks through what do we need to do to position this city for prosperity in the very different world of the 21st century. <clears throat> so that was the probably the shortest version of this that you've done. So let me, let me begin this, this process of the questions and the kind of comments. And I wanted to do this with you because uh, after 41 years of doing this, after impressing upon the Houston community the need for change around a myriad of issues, the one that keeps coming back and surfacing to the top is education. Right. Uh, and so the Chronicle did a wonderful editorial that basically says, Dr. Kleinberg has been telling us uh, forecasting for us, in some ways warning us, uh, cajoling us as to what we need to do, and why are we so hesitant to act and move forward? What's holding us back, Dr. Kleinberg? What is, what is the resistance uh, to using the data to find ways to translate the evolving understanding into sustained and effective action? Yeah, well, that's the great question, right? That's the central, central issue that Houston faces. What we've been doing is, 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 I tell you, don't don't blame me. I'm just asking the questions. People are answering these questions differently. And one example is uh, a question we asked about public schools in Houston. Do the schools have enough money, if it was used wisely, to provide a quality education, or do you think the schools will need significantly more money to provide a quality education? During the 1990s, clear majorities, 58, 60 percent, said the schools have all the money they need is being wasted. During the first decade of the 21st century, it was a 50-50 split. We stopped asking the question, came back in 2018, 2020, and 2022, and a sea change has occurred. 58, 60, 67 percent in the survey this year said the schools will need significantly more money to provide a quality education. The public understands how critical education has become in determining opportunities for people in this global knowledge economy. Uh, Tremendous support for preschool, a question that said, are you, are you in favor or opposed to increasing local taxes in order to provide universal preschool education for every child in Houston? 58, 60% saying, yes, increase the taxes. Houston is behind San Antonio and behind Dallas and the percent of, of, of kids who have access to quality preschool. So the real question is, why is it so difficult for us to, to, to address these issues effectively? And I think part of it is our history. The source of wealth in Houston was oil. 82% of all the jobs in Houston in 1980 were tied into the price of oil. Price of oil went from $3.20 to $38 by 1982. Houston had been building and borrowing on the basis of $50 oil, sudden collapse of the oil boom. But during the first 80 years of the 20th century, you couldn't, you, you didn't have to do much to, to position Houston for success. You didn't have to make any big sacrifices. You didn't have to increase taxes in any way. We were riding the oil boom. And now the future depends on us, and, and it's, a, it's a new reality. And I think Houstonians have, have, don't have a history of sort of drawing on their resources to, to position the city for prosperity when, when at the same time there's this dramatic transformation in the ethnic composition of the population, when of everybody under the age of, of 20 in all of Harris County, who will, the people who will be the workers and voters and citizens and taxpayers, of everybody under the age of 20, Today, 51% are Latinos, 19% are African Americans, 10% are Asians, 21% of everybody under 20 is Anglo. 
So the young people who will be the future of Houston are disproportionately African-American, Latino, the two groups most likely to be living in poverty. We know what poverty does to your ability to succeed in the public school systems. That's the great challenge, right? Will, can we muster our resources to ensure that young African-American Latino kids grow up prepared to do the jobs of the 21st century in the leadership positions in the city? Uh, and that's a, you know, that's a difficult set of, of challenges that, that the city faces. One other kind of interesting dynamic is this, the, we've been increasingly embracing the diversity. It's one of the great strengths of Houston. We realize how enriched our lives have been by the restaurants and the fiestas and the festivals and the variety of folks who have made this city the most interesting place in America. This is where all, all the peoples, all the ethnicities, all the religions of the world are coming together in one remarkable place. Uh, and, and that, that uh, embrace is, is powerful. But the biggest predictor among Anglos of comfort with diversity and support for immigration is not education, it's not gender, it's age. Younger Anglos take for granted what old, we older Anglos are struggling to accept. So it's a part of this process of dramatic change, but also room in, in the Houston surveys to have some real optimism, to see us gradually, unmistakably, reluctantly, but, but realistically coming to grips with the challenges yeah. of the 21st century. Thank you. So we, we know where we need to go. Uh, we just need to figure out how we're going to get there and how we just need to figure out those steps. I'm always intrigued when you do the survey every year, when you talk about the younger Houstonians, and that's true, the trends are changing, the thought patterns are changing, uh, how they see their role and their place in this society and in Houston is changing. But the, the power and the decision-making is still in the older generation. And so the, the diversity of Houston, which you have taught me all these years, is one of our greatest strengths. But at the same time, we're also one of the most segregated cities in America. We're one of the most gated communities in America. So our chances of interaction with those, interacting with those who can make change happen uh, is somewhat limited because part of the phrase that I hear, and I've said this to you many times over the years, because I keep hearing it, uh, not as frequent as we used to. Right. Uh, when we talk about children in urban education needing help and needing to be uh, helped out of poverty, the, the phrase that you hear sometimes, that those are not my children. Those are not my children. Now, what's so interesting about that, that phrase, when it comes from people I know and from the old generation, they're committed to the city. They're dedicated Houstonians. They give, they write a check for charity in a, in a heartbeat to help somebody. There is a disconnect. It is not a mean-spirited statement. It is not a necessarily an ugly statement. It's not even a racist statement. There's a total disconnect between these children who need help and how they see their lives. They've raised, they've reared their children, they've reared their grandchildren, they put them to school, put them to college, they're done. So how do we make this appeal to those and others? Because I've always said that empathy is the road to equity. Empathy is the road to equity. How do we make that appeal to get them to understand that this is part of the issues they should be involved in? Because the opposite of poverty is not charity. The opposite of poverty is justice. Mm. And so we have to start addressing these things. It seems to be in a more aggressive manner. What What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, those. I mean, you you you've been so articulate on this, and so and, and so so much a leader in our thinking about uh, this transformation. I mean, it's as we were saying, there, every year, uh, you, you, uh, one 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 counter to to that. The, these are not our children. Is that we are falling in love with each other, marrying, making multiracial babies across across in a in a way we've never seen before in American history. And Houston is leading the way of all the marriages involving an Asian in the last three years, 32% involved a non-Asian. Of all the married US-born Latinos, 28% are married to non-Latinos. There's been an 800% increase in black-white marriages between uh, 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 1990 and 2015. We are the fastest growing ethnic community in, in Houston in America are the children of, of our, our multiracial kids, right? So. So we're, the, the real challenge for the future of Houston is not so much anymore an ethnic divide, it's a class divide. In right. every community, a growing middle class and a growing underclass predicated above all else on access to quality education. And so that's, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's this combination of what sociologists call eth class, a combination of both ethnicity and, and class. 
but right, it's really a class divide. It's our, it's, it's it, it, uh, rich, rich kids, uh, rich people from all uh, ethnicities can make sure that their kids get a wonderful education in the private schools. I tell people, you know, in Houston, you send a child to Kincaid or St. John's and then, and then uh, to Rice University and then a law degree or a medical degree or, or a PhD from Harvard, Princeton, UCLA. We've got, we've got the best universities in the world, but, but, uh, limited access and, and and it's a class division and and one example of that is the one eth the one demographic in america that's suffering the most the one demographic whose life expectancy has dropped in the last 10 years who are dying of what economists call the diseases of despair drug addiction alcoholism suicide it is white men with high school educations or less living in small town or rural areas so it's a powerful reminder that it's a class divide. It's a division in every community, growing middle class and a growing underclass, predicated above all else on access to quality education. And that's just become so obvious and, and evident and, and so central to Houston's future, because as we were saying, we are the, the young people every year you, you find more and more. You know, I give a talk every year basically to the business community. And uh, it's still overwhelmingly white men, but not nearly as much as it was five years and 10 years ago. And not nearly, and much, but much more than it's going to be five or 10 years from now. There's an inevitability to this process. There's no force in the world that can stop Houston or Texas or America from, from becoming more African-American, more Asian, more Latino, and less Anglo as the 21st century unfolds. Nothing in the world can stop that. The only question we have to address is how do we make this work? How do we ensure that this diversity becomes a great asset that it can be? Right. So as we go through this middle passage <laughs> to get to that reality that you just described, which, okay. which is a great reality with optimism and hope, uh, the, the, the problem I think is occurring, though, is that the change may be moving, but it's moving at such a slow pace that people are frustrated. Right. And the point that you raised about the white male who may have not had a great opportunity for an education, may not have availed themselves of education, less than high school in some cases. That's where the danger is coming from in this, no, this new multiracial society, majority, minority. This inflamed ethnic division from that group of people. Uh, it's been said that there's a need in many people's lives, the group that you described, to figure out to have something or someone to hate to give meaning to their lives because they have felt left out of the American dream. They feel right. they're at the bottom. And that's why it's easier to talk about that we're being invaded by others, that they're trying to replace us. The illusion of civility has completely gone out of the window. So the marginalized that you talk about among the Anglo male population are looking for someone to blame. And what happens as we see played out in the shootings, hate is an addictive drug. And you can you can weaponize and 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 convert people very easily who feel they have no power because that's really what it is. It's always about power. And feel that they're being ignored and and neglected. And that's why they they take it out of minorities. They're looking for somebody to blame. Uh, and so the, the question I have to ask is one that you have always talked about: the distinction between soft power and hard power. We believe you and I and others like us. Uh, sociologists and others, that the soft power is in the relationships that we develop built on mutual trust and respect, because nothing happens without trust. And that's great. We can get a lot of things done. But there's a limit to what we can get done in the in arena of soft power, because the real power lies with the hard power, the policy, the economics, the money people, all right? The people we keep talking about who we need to make the change. Those people who have the power the position, the authority, the voice to be able to make the change. So yeah, we so end up, and I'll end on this point, we end up spending so much time with charity. We've done a great job. We have educated people on charity. We got charity down pat. Houston is the most giving, caring, philanthropic community. We know charity. We don't know justice. And until we can figure out how to educate and get people an understanding about justice as we've done such a great job on charity, nothing's going to really change. Because it is about more money. The schools need more money. Poor pupil per student per school needs more money. Money is the solution. <laughs>
money Jonathan is Coles, right? That is so, Jonathan Coles will say it, savage inequality. How do we know money is not the solution? We've never put enough money into the school system to know, to, to equalize. Right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So now I forgot what I was, I was going to say. <laughs> you and I have been at this a long time. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, there's so many different pieces here. Of uh, There's a... I think one of the big lessons of these of this 40 years of surveys that we've been doing is the disjuncture between public opinion and politically effective opinion. When we measure, when we ask people in the privacy of their, of their homes, how do you see the world? Public opinion is shifting in terms of much more embrace of diversity, much more recognition of the critical importance of education. I mentioned some of the survey questions we've been asking over the years that have just picked up a, a clear understanding on, on the part of, of Houstonians today in a way that was not the case five or ten years ago of how critical education has become and how, how much we need to invest in, we need to spend more money to, to provide universal preschool and after school programs and so on. Um, so the real problem is that it takes a long time for that shift of understanding that we've been me measuring in our surveys to get translated into politically effective behavior. Because mm -hmm. of who votes? Who controls the political apparatus? Who, who controls the legislature so it can, it can do the redistricting that will ensure the election of some people rather than others? Who, uh, who contributes money to the campaigns? Uh, uh, the last time there was this kind of inequality in America in the 1920s, Louis Brandeis, a great jurist in the Supreme Court, was quoted as saying, we can have concentrated wealth in the hands of a few, or we can have democracy. We cannot have both. And that's another piece that's going on. Of, mm -hmm. in the th 30 years after World War II, the, there was broad-based prosperity. Everybody did better. In the last 40 years, virtually all the benefits of economic growth have gone to the richest 20% of Americans. And it's that, it's, it's, it's that uh, ability to influence the, the, the process of change that is slow and difficult and, and filled with, with anxieties and insecurities as we've been talking to, to about. So this is a very interesting and complicated time. But there's room for a lot of optimism here because you can see people changing. I tell people, and as you were saying, almost every issue that you care about, there are wonderful things happening in the city. Tremendous people working hard on those issues, caring about them, eager to have you join them. And whatever your passion, not enough yet is happening in Easton. And we need to become a learning society. I, I tell every every business in Houston ought to adopt a school and spend one and send their employees to spend one afternoon a month tutoring a child, getting to know a kid, asking what can, what can I do to be helpful. Every church ought to provide universal preschool preschool education and after school programs. And we need to become a learning society. One of the great advanced things that Houston has is, is, you know, this growing, highly educated Anglo population that is aging. The leading edge of the 76 million baby boomers turn 77 this year. But there's going to be a doubling of people over 65 in the next 25 years, overwhelmingly Anglos, overwhelmingly highly educated. Let's figure out a way to bring them into the, into the system to to work on the tutoring kids and helping kids succeed. Let's become a, a learning society that puts its resources, both monetary, but especially human resources, into, into serious effort to change the trajectory, to ensure that this inevitable transformation of young African-American Latino kids will, who are going to become adults and, and, and either angry adults or, or wonderfully constructive and positive adults, much will depend on how we collectively invest in, in, in these programs. And a lot of good things are happening. You're, you've been a part of them. You know you know what's what's out there. And I think it is fair to say that we, we're not doing nearly enough yet. And we need to find a way to galvanize that, uh, that understanding. So is it part of it, the challenge for us uh, to help people understand is to change the narrative? Because if we change the narrative, we change the outcome. I mean, is it is it as simple as changing the terms of the debate to get people to see the, the movement that has to happen from, and I'll use again the, the analogy because I think it works here so well. We've put so much money and resources into education already in public education over the years, all kinds of projects and foundations, et cetera. We have very little to show for it because what happened with that, it was still a charitable response to a reaction to what was not happening. It was downstream thinking. Rather than doing upstream thinking, which is proactive to talk about systemic change eradication, 
what's causing the problems to start with. So you don't have to deal with them as they as they come downstream. That to me is the hard lifting. That's the heavy lifting. That's where the hard decisions have to be made. That's where the question behind the questions have to be asked. And you have to really get deep and you have to probe deeply and you have to upset, as they used to say in the old country, delicate sensibilities have to be upset to be able to get to the, the real core issues. We don't want to do that. We love to fine tune and tweak around the edges well, and course. do a little change, incremental change, and be comfortable with that rather than tackling the real hard issue, which are found in what? Poverty and systemic racism and institutional racism. We don't want to deal with that. And because we haven't dealt with that, we're paying and continue to pay the price of what we have, the lack of access to economic opportunity, the lack of access to growing inequalities, the lack of access to education in a, in a quality manner will continue and only going to get worse. Okay. Well, the reason why I'm more of an optimist than you are on these issues is because you can see the changes, right? You can that question about spending on, on the school, first of all, we're not spending a lot of money on education. Houston is at the bottom in, in, in Texas, so they are at the bottom in their spending on education. Te Houston has the greatest medical complex in the world in the Texas Medical Center, and we have the highest percentage of children without health insurance. We're, we're coming out of a world where you didn't need education to make money, right? The great Texas fortunes were made from land, all the things you could do on the land, cotton, timber, cattle, sugar, oil. The source of wealth in the 21st century is no longer uh, natural resources, it's human resources. And this is new, and, and, it's, and Houston has never had to do that. But I see a growing understanding of, that, of, of, of those realities. That, that, uh, that sea change in the statement that says the schools will need significantly more money, that opens up opportunities that were not here 10 years ago. To, to speak to that and to really come together. And it's not just, a, as we were saying, money, it's also the human resources that we have in abundance in the city. The, the belief in the city, one of my favorite things I tell people is, uh, people in our surveys complain because we invite them to about traffic, pollution, crime, the no mountains, the hot summers, the flying cockroaches. And then we say, well, how would you rate the Houston area as a place to live? It's a wonderful place to live. Just overwhelmingly, the general public loves the city, believes in Houston, wants this, feels we get a bum rap in the rest of the country in, our, in people's understandings of what the city's doing. And I think there's real opportunity to, to, to take significant action. We were talking earlier about a new mayor coming online for, for the, during this next critical eight years that will be absolutely central to the kind of city that we're going to be building as, as that baby boom gen, or as, a, as those African-American Latino kids who are 70% of everybody under 20 moves into adulthood. Uh, these next, so this is maybe an opportunity to sort of take take the the, the lessons and the and the positions that we've already developed with with our current mayor and and work with the new mayor to sort of say, okay, this is this is it. This is, this is, what is your goal of it uh, in by 2035, 2036? 36, 36. 36 will be the 200th anniversary of, of Houston's founding. Tremendous opportunity to say, okay, we we know this now. We're ready. And it's not just money, it's all of us. It's, and and you know, as I tell people all the time, whatever your passion, there are wonderful things happening in the city and whatever your passion, not enough yet is happening. But there's room for some optimism here, it seems to me, if we can harness that energy and that belief into effective action. I'm very optimistic, I've always been. That's what keeps me going and keeps me doing this. But okay. I'm also trying to be a practical realist uh, and deal with reality as I see my, my people and my children suffering. Uh, the, the, the suffering that you see in these schools as you go around to these black and Latino uh, schools, the same ones every year that are on the bottom of the list, the same ones every year that are failing our students, the same ones every year that, that have the low test scores. Uh, and this has been going on in, in for 10 years straight. So the question that you raise is a good one. So maybe we ought to put a conference together in the fall to address the real issues. Uh, let's just use the 2036 timetable because it gives us a, a benchmark. So Mayor Turner, as you mentioned, is the 62nd mayor of the city. The 63rd mayor will be the next mayor uh, eight years later. The 64th mayor into the first year of her second term <laughs> will be the mayor in Discovery Green on August 30, 2036, celebrating the 200th anniversary of the city. Okay. What is her speech? We, we should start writing her speech now. What is she going to be saying about this great city? 
And my contention is that you will not be able to say the things that need to be said at that great speech in 2036 in Discovery Green on August 30th without addressing this basic question. What is the fair and ethical treatment of all human beings in Houston, Texas? What is the fair moral ethical treatment? We have never established what a baseline looks like for treating each other equally, for having, for having that discussion. Because the two antecedents that go with that main question are these two. All human beings' lives matter. All human beings are equal. That's, that's what we're trying to get to. And that's the piece that's so hard to get to. Because to do that, what I'm beginning to realize, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Kleinberg, I can say Steve after, after 40 years of knowing. Of course. People are, people, I'm, I'm more convinced every day that people don't really want to deal with equality. They want to deal with fairness. Mm. And, and, and the, how do we approach this so people can see the fairness in this as another human being to another human being, just from a humanity perspective, because I am a human being and you are, stop right there. No other labels, no other the, the po talking points, just on that basis. That's okay. what we have to get to. So I have some optimism on that too. We've been following a series of different questions over the years and, uh, about, for example, do you think most people on welfare today are really in need of help or are they taking advantage of the system? Government should take action to reduce the income differences between rich and poor in America. A whole set of questions of that sort uh, that indicate increasing belief in Houston that people are poor through no fault of their own. And they are locked in and, and the great belief that we've always had that this is a land of opportunity. Anyone can make it. Increasingly in Houston, people realize that, that there are those barriers. It's not just education. It's also uh, access to affordable housing. It's also uh, food deserts. It's it's all the things that poverty does to make it to, to create the barriers that prevent people from being successful. And the public, again, is more aware of that and more prepared to take action on those on that score than it's been before. So there's there's room in Houston, it seems to me. And, and my, my feeling is, we, is and I sort of say goodbye to the surveys and move on, give it to give it to the next generation to to continue this research. It does seem to me that there's a lesson there. The lesson is think bigger recognize that 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 there's a receptivity out there in the general public to to understanding these issues that there five or ten years ago and that we there are things that are possible for us and and we need we need to act on it it's not going to be automatic it's not going to be overnight but it's but there's a real understanding that this that that this diversity is our destiny that 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 uh, we can we can make the city a much more successful place and 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 we're going to be whether we like it or not a model for the rest of the country by 2050 all of america will look like houston looks today we are there first how we navigate this transition will have enormous significance not just for the houston future but for the american future this is where the american future is going to be worked out and i think we need to take that seriously and recognize that what we're dealing with here is is something that is central to the kind of America that we will have in the 20, 21st century. The challenges of terrible inequalities and poverty in Houston are echoed across the country, right? And so, and, and there are lessons that we can draw on from other from other cities that have been more successful and been working on this longer. And there are wonderful lessons that we can offer offer to. to but we need to we need to just become a a, a, a more activated community saying that we're all in this together and we can make this work. I totally agree with you. So let me make one comment and then we're going to transition to our questions that we may have from our group vis-a-vis -vis the chat. Um, I think you're correct. We in this city have the great opportunity to do what others in urban cities have not been able to do, to move the bar from just having people survive. We've moved them now to having helping them thrive. That's great. But we got to get to the next level, which is flourish, to help human beings flourish. Human beings were intended to flourish to the <laughs> fullest of their God-given potential. How do we help all human beings to flourish? That should be our goal. That should be our aspirational goal in this city to ensure whatever it takes to make that, that happen for all human beings. And I agree with you. If any city in America can pull it off, I think Houston can. <laughs> but we're going to have to start working a lot harder, a lot deeper, a lot, a lot more intense uh, to make it happen. 
Yeah, and we need to believe that it can happen. And to believe that it can happen. Yes. Right. Yeah. And well, look, I, you know, I used to run search for the homeless. The the, the homeless count was up to fifteen, almost fifteen thousand at one time, really? down to twelve, and then ten. Now seven. It's down to about four thousand now. So we know we can do it. Right. And now we just got to figure out how to get to do the rest of the four thousand. We can eliminate homelessness in Houston, Texas. Right. All right. So That's if we can do that, we can also do the same thing with education. Uh, but, yeah. you know, it's going to take a lot of us the hard work at the plow, as they used to say, uh, and coming up with innovation and creativity to make it happen and commitment and transparency and all those things that go with it and accountability. That's going to be the key word, I think, to get this stuff done. Accountability. All right. Let's transition to some questions uh, and we will go on. Let's see who we have here. Uh, OK, we're going to do a switch. <laughs> uh climate change oh okay if we don't solve the climate change uh, catastrophe catastrophe we will never make it to 2036 or to 2050. uh your thoughts on that dr kleinberg right beautiful question absolutely absolutely right and, and you know we're the oil and gas capital of, of america and the world can we be the energy capital as we go forward into a world where we phase out of oil and gas and move into re renewable energies that are much less destructive of the environment? Our surveys have picked that up also. We've asked over the years, uh, how serious the problem is global warming? We should say very serious, somewhat serious, and not much of a problem. Percent saying it's a very serious problem, went from 38% in 2010 to, to 58% today. And then even more striking was a question that said, do you think is, is global warming due to uh, normal climate cycles or to human activities and the percent saying it's not normal cycles it's human activity for which we are responsible and we need to change has, all, has gone up to 70 percent believing that so so and 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 the great question for houston and this economy is can can we lead the nation in the energy transition or are we going to fight against it and have other other cities and other other nations come forward with the, with the new technologies and leave us further further behind. That's a powerful question for the Houston future of, of whether we can take the lead in in that in, in embracing the realities and necessity for that for that transition out of fossil fuels into the renewable resources of the 21st century. And part of the challenge in in the environmental environmental discussion, which I totally agree with everything you just said, is the is the issue of environmental justice. Uh, and the environmental justice piece is being played out every day in neighborhoods and communities uh, who had this terrible things placed and put in their community and neighborhoods over the years. And now we're beginning to find out the after effects of all of that. Uh, that has to be addressed at the same time. We worry about the larger picture of environmental change and global warming. Uh, do you see any movement to that? I mean, that's back to our original question about how we treat human beings. Why do we want them to be around Pre-sold plants and garbage uh, units and et cetera. It just it just gets to be kind of insane. Well, and it ties into the broader issues that we've been talking about. The the uh, who's at the table? That's right. the point you make all the time, right? Who's who who makes these decisions about where to put the incinerators? And in the old days, there were only old white men at the table. That's not as true today, and it's it's going to be much less true tomorrow. Uh, and so so there's a real opportunity to say to to have to have voices heard. That that uh, were, were not heard in the same way uh, when, when these when these original yeah. environmental injustices were, were were perpetuated. And we have so many issues related that we have to work through. And just touch on that for a moment, because you're correct. Uh, but I, when I talk to people involved now in, in corporate DEI work, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, there's a there's an interesting frustration there. We work so hard to get everyone around the table to get to the minorities and the women and those we needed to diversify the table. The challenge is becoming more and more that all voices around the table are not equal. All voices around the table are not listened to equally or taken as seriously as still many times the white male. That's the ongoing challenge. It's also a source of frustration to those not working in, in cohort groups and DEI work. So on multiple levels, we have so many challenges that we have to address at the same time, but I do feel we're getting there. I mean, we will get there over time. Uh, the, 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 the change of pace is just so slow, <laughs> so slow. Okay, here we go. Next question. How much ability does Houston as a city have 
to override state and federal decisions around education and health care and funding of how these come to us. That's always a hard question because of Texas. We're just a weird state when it comes to that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are, I mean it's a broader picture of, of the there are barriers in the way of progress that come from our history, that come from the way we've done business, the, 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 the importance we attach to education all the way from the beginning. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's not surprising that there's frustration that, that we're not changing as rapidly as, as we need to, but we're changing importantly and we're changing inevitably. We're changing unidirectionally. There's no going back to the, to the dominance of white males. And, and as we were saying earlier, a lot of white males are not, not entirely happy about this. The single most powerful predictor of, of comfort with diversity among Anglos is age. Younger Anglos are taking for granted what older Anglos are struggling to accept. So all of this is part of a time of, of you know, just rapid change and change is difficult. And, 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 uh, and people who were in power and, t and took for granted their, their, that they, they were the ones making decisions now have to learn to share that decision making process. And in, that, in, in the process, discover that better decisions are made when more people are at the table. But, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Now, the money that, you know, you're right, but, but the money that comes from the feds to the state that's a pass through from the state to the city or vis a from the county to the city, uh, it's really complicated in Texas because we send so much federal dollars back because we won't do the matching. We won't accept it. We won't accept federal funds. We, we could expand Medicaid uh, to much, much more uh, t uh, Texans who are in need of Medicaid services, but we want to take the federal money because we don't want to match it, and therefore we don't. With education, right. we leave money on the table with education too, funds that could be brought into the state and dispersed among the, the school district. So it's, it's, it's becoming more of a, a us and them and political battle. Uh, it's becoming more of the question for citizens in a civic environment to help shift the policy and help them shift the debate around the policy to achieve the goals we're trying to get to. And, and that's, not a, that's not a Republican or Democrat or red or blue. That's just the reality about how we treat human beings. And, uh, if, from, and the, 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 con the consequences I mentioned is, is uh, we have the greatest medical complex in the world, private funds, and we have the highest percentage of children without health insurance of any major city in the country. Higher, higher than El Paso. High. I mean, it's it's just crazy that we leave that money on the table and don't don't accept the idea that we're part of the broader community of 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 cities and and states and we and 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 that money is is, is ours. I mean, we we give much more money to the federal government than we get back because of our anti-government attitudes and much of that is beginning to change. I think also, but it, but it's. You know, it's easy to be. There are lots of reasons for pessimism and lots of reasons for optimism. And so there's there's room for for various positions here. But ultimately, I think that it's it's hard to be pessimistic in, about Houston because you've got this continuing improvements in people's understandings of these issues, increasing recognition of the of the of, of what the 21st century is going to require for us to be successful. No longer is our position in the East Texas oil fields a basis for our wealth. On the contrary, we've got to move rapidly away from oil and gas as a, as a source of, of income. And of course, that's where much of our income is still still resides. So these are these are tough questions. And it's not surprising that, that uh, you know, not everybody's on board yet. But but there is room, I think, to, to believe that each day, each year, we do we, we move further closer to that new, that new reality. Just the hope is that the power is still in the hands of the citizens. It's still in the hands of the electorate. It's still in the hands of those in society uh, from a civic culture perspective that can make change. But it's, it's not lost on me that we're taping and filming this today on election day uh, yeah. here in Texas. Uh, you know, our, but our civic culture is coming apart. It is, is in many ways is disintegrating into a series of disconnected, warring fact, uh, 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 fragments. And we can't have that. We, we, it's, it's continually showing the detriment and the, and, the, and the issues and problems that it's causing by this continuing unable to compromise, to negotiate, to come to the table. Uh, and at some point that has to stop because by the time it does revert itself back to the middle perhaps, the damage that will be done, the souls, the lives of people that will be hurt, some permanently will be, will be you can't come back and change that. Uh, in post-COVID world or 
not post-COVID world, the COVID world that we live in, the, the stress and anxiety and tension is already so great. Now you add these social, economic, political factors on top of the health challenges and the stress and anxiety from COVID. You have people every day that are just trying to hold on, literally by their fingernails every day, and figuring out how to survive until the change, whatever the change looks like, comes. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, you're right. I mean, and uh, you put your finger on one of the central questions about our politics. Can we can we come together and, uni and unify? And, and also, you're right that when we ask people what's the biggest problem facing people in the Houston area today, it used to be traffic. Traffic is terrible, but it's no longer the dominant problem in people's minds. It's the economy. It's inflation. It's the cost of gasoline and, and, and food. It's it's crime. Houston has one of the highest crime rates in the country. People are people are scared. It's it's a pandemic that is still among us and and in in our lives, and so all of that creates deep anxiety that that is looking for an outlet. And we and we we demonize each other, Democrats are, and Republicans, and and that's a real challenge and a real problem. And and ultimately, we will not be able to address these issues if we can't come together and understand it. As we are. Civic society has worked all these years based upon a shade of purple, a shade of purple. Right. In between somewhere red and blue, but we've mixed ourselves. Association were able to happen, and until that returns, we're not going to be able to, to move forward. Next question from our chat area here says very clearly: How do we move the money to the place that it needs to be, rather than what's been done in the past? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> Well, and it's part of what we've been talking about. How do you how do we define where it needs to be, and and are we spending the money in in the ways that it, that make the most sense? And 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 your point that that we're not addressing the poverty, we're not we're not ensuring the kind of opportunities that we'd like to think we have in Houston for the vast majority of African American Latinos who are falling further behind, who are struggling to to make ends meet, who are dealing with a whole range of different of different things that have come upon us. That uh, that make life very difficult for people, and and we need to we need to address that. And I, as I say, I think the reason for some optimism is that the decision making process now is is more variegated, more more integrated, more more a range of views than than we've had before. And so some of that is going to be a possibility as we go forward. I think the money to to, to take a stab at the question. I think the money changes and moves when we define our values. Um, and I think the, the challenge today is we don't have a clearly articulated set of common values. Uh, and I, I think as a country, as Americans, uh, as citizens, there used to be a prescribed kind of understood, kind of bought into common set of uh, values. That doesn't exist today. And so money, they always say follow the money. Uh, what, when you follow the money, the money follows your values. Uh, you, you fund the things that you truly value. Uh, and so I think the question becomes now, what do we value as, as, as citizens, as human beings, as, as Americans, as Texans, as Houstonians? Because the things that we say we really value and have passion and conviction behind those values, the money will show up. It always has. <laughs> right. Right. So it's, again, reaching consensus on, on, right. on what those values are. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I think that the lack of shared values, therefore, precludes the lack of shared vision. There is, I mean, the whole shared vision that we keep talking about only comes out of a sense of shared values. And those discussions we used to have earnestly in this city, because I'm old enough to remember those, and so is Dr. Kleinberg. We don't have the value-laden conversations and discussions anymore. We assume that we're operating from the same value perspectives and platforms. That's not true anymore. Social media and ability on the internet to find your own camp, to find your own network, to find your own people, to find your own tribe, to your sense of belonging, has shaped your perspective on values. And, and, and so when you, when you come together with the dialogue, you see that, right? You see when we come together with the dialogue, this is the diversion of the values discussion. Yeah, I, I guess that's right. I mean, I'd, I'm not sure the value. Do you, do you think people who take different views from from ours or don't have the same values? I think they do have much the same values. It's a difference in in who do you trust and 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 
and and how do we go forward in a way that protects me and my and my interests and uh, you know, I, there's room there for consensus to develop if we really were serious about talking values are not that different from, from right? well, I always was taught don't don't follow the words follow the actions and behaviors hmm. and what I see is that the action behaviors don't follow the articulated values that's okay. just you know that's my reality uh, from where I sit <laughs> Uh, and I think that's that's the challenge we have in a wonderful city like Houston with diversity, with all the ethnicity. Because I think African Americans and Anglo's and Hispanics and Latinos and and Asians, I think we, depending on where you sit and where you stand, how you see these issues and what's been your experience, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I've shared that with you all. Otherwise, I know that my lens, my lens was has been tainted early on as a child because I grew, I grew up literally with the Ku Klux Klan. Literally grew up in Orange, Texas every day with the Ku Klux Klan. So when I talk about experiences of understanding people's values as, a, as, a, as espoused verbally and articulated, when I see their actions and behaviors, it betrays very clearly what their articulated values were. And that's all I can go by. You know, don't tell me you love me, just show me you love me. Use words <laughs> only as necessary. That's always been kind of my, my benchmark. Yes. Uh, so anyway, going forward, we got another great question here. Uh, so we're going to take that. Uh, I told you, Stephen, I can do this all night for the rest of the century. Uh, but anyway, capitalism. Capitalism funds the things that bring profit and wealth to the few. Those few decide what the values are, not the other way around. Very true. Mm. Capitalism is a driver, right? Right, and 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 rarely will people act in ways that are are contrary to their self interest, right? And so that's what capitalism does. Is, but but uh, there's a, you can broaden, you can have broader self interest. You can recognize that my well being in, in 2013 or 20 was it again 2036? <laughs> my well being in 2036 will have a lot to do with with the well being of of, of African Americans and Latinos. Because they are, they will be the future, and and uh, that sense of of uh, of what is in my interest, more broadly defined, is really what has saved America from from the ravages of of excessive capitalism, where everybody's out for themselves with minimum attention, because we're so interconnected. And and uh, you know, I, I'm I think of the tremendous strength of the religious communities in Houston, and and that where where there's a Reminder constantly, even in this capitalist city, city of ours, of the broader values that that and and the broader truths. I mean, what what really what what makes what what gives you a sense of well-being? It's a belief that you belong and that and that people care about you. And 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 why have we alienated uh, less educated Anglo's because we have not paid much attention to the class divisions that are that are so powerful and that we're beginning to recognize now is important. So. It's it's a, a process of of broader definitions of what we looking what are we looking for what do we want to achieve what 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 would make a make a great city and you've been so wonderfully articulate on that for it's that vision the beloved community right that yeah. that, yeah. that Mark the King talked about that is so that, and and that that can motivate people beyond just what a capitalist system uh, would, would assume. Well, you you taught me a phrase back when. Where where does where does enlightened self interest come in? Because that's that's it, right? At some point, the, the at some point the light bulb goes off. Uh, enlightened self interest says we're all in this together. And it says you you will benefit when when these other folks benefit as well. And it's and it's it, and enlightened self interest is when when uh, you know we lead the way in in a, in, in moving in in the energy transition, even though it. it counteracts our short-term interest in, in developing the oil that we have in the ground. We know in the long term that that, that 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 that's the direction we're heading and we need to be in the leadership position to to benefit from the from the opportunities that the new the, the new inventions are going to provide. That's enlightened self-interest. It's a it's a more intelligent wider view of 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 what is in my self-interest. Because the other point is that no one will act in ways that they don't believe are in their self-interest. Right. Right. So, all right, back to our questions. Okay. Uh, there is a difference between the values of the governing class and the values of the people given 
recent polls on abortion and gun control and elections versus the recent legal changes and challenges. Uh, I guess that really says there's two different set of values at work here between the governing class and basically the rest of society. <laughs> Yeah, and it's what we were talking about, the dis disjuncture between public opinion and politically effective opinion. Right? Who, who controls the political process? And, and that's, that's a big challenge. And, 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 and yet, uh, so the example I like to use is, is gay rights, which was uh, one, of the, one of the signal transformations that has occurred in public opinion over the years. When, when we first asked the questions in the early 90s, are you, are you agree or disagree? Marriages between homosexuals should have the same legal status as heterosexual marriages. Are you in favor or opposed to allowing homosexual couples to legally adopt children? Do you think homosexuality is morally wrong? Is it morally acceptable? Every one of those questions shows this sea change from from the 20s to the 60s in say, in in giving a pro gay gay rights position, and that 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 has transformed the politics. And no, and people are not. They're talking about transgender things, but they're not talking about about oppressing uh, and and denying opportunities to, to gays because because of their sexual orientation. That's a nice example of how public opinion gradually but inevitably transforms public policy, and that's a big part of what we need to try to facilitate because the public opinion in Houston is calling for a, a much more enlightened public policy than what we're getting from our from our current uh, leadership. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. <clears throat> How do we get the voices of the people who do not have the values of most of the people, but not the money to run for office into the political discussion or at the decision-making table? <clears throat> that's just sort of what we've just been talking yeah. about. I mean, that's a good that, one though. That's a great question, that's right. Do you think uh, part of the answer to that is more civic education uh, and awareness of how the system truly operates and how the system really runs? Certainly, it has to do with voting, right? And, and one, one of the reasons for that disjuncture is that poor African Americans and Latinos, are, especially Latinos, are much less likely to vote, even when they're registered, when they're all, you know, all, all the. Pro we old white guys vote no matter what. Young <laughs> Latinos vote are much less. Like, so that's a big part of it, getting your voice heard. And, and, and a big part of the democratic efforts is to mobilize the vote because it's there. And 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 it's it's the responsibility of, of, of our politics to broaden the participation in the political system. And if we don't broaden that participation, we will get more and more disjuncture between what people want to see happen and what's actually happening by because who votes, who controls the political apparatus, who who contributes to campaigns are all a big part of what determines the, the actual decisions that are made in Austin and the actions that are taken. We have a few minutes left, Dr. Kleinberg, so I'm going to give you a chance to have the, the last closing word. Uh, but while I'm doing that, I'm also going to give our audience a chance if anybody still has that, that, that burning desirous question that has to get out and that you have to ask. I will give you the opportunity uh, to do that while Dr. Kleinberg uh, give us uh, his closing thoughts and remarks. <clears throat> go ahead, Doc. Anybody out there? <laughs> it's all yours. No, go ahead. I'll come back to your question if there is one. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here and Larry, wonderful as always to, to be with you. And, and you know, we've been talking about these issues for a long time and, and none of them are, are new anymore, but but you do have a sense that we're beginning to mobilize and beginning to to recognize that we're that you know I think the value of these surveys has been to to clarify what what people are thinking out there. You know, we tend to talk to and become close friends with and fall in love with people who have views very much like our own, and and it's very valuable to be able to see and that when you take a representative random sample of all of us. That, that progressive attitudes and ideas are, are in fact beginning to emerge and in par powerful ways. And, and to recognize that what, what passes for our politics is not, is not what, what uh, is reflected in the attitudes and perceptions of, of ordinary, ordinary Houstonians across the board. And, and, and as I end this 40 years of, of our research, and it's, and it's going to go on, it's going to be passed on to a wonderful guy who's just joining us after 20 years with the RAND Corporation, a real expert on survey research, who will continue the, and expand the surveys as we go forward. This is the most interesting and consequential city in America. This is where the American future is being worked out. 
and 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 the people who live in the city, believe in the city, love the city, feel we got a bum rap in the rest of the country. This is a real opportunity to to uh, put our heads together, put our um, lead with our hearts and our minds, and and recognize the self interest that all of us have in building a city that can be a model for all the rest of the country. And uh, it's, it's been a tremendous privilege for me to be able to to do this kind of research and to sort of become a uh, you know, uh, and Houston is the only city in America that has a survey that has been done in this way for this amount of time. And it's and and it's been a wonderful tribute, I think, to the city of Houston, the support that people have given to want, wanting to see that data, wanting to hear what's happening, even if I'm not happy about it all the time. I want to know and I want to and and this, and and the final message, I think, is just one of of, of that we've been touching on throughout this discussion. It's it's hard not to be optimistic. I mean, you've got a city that is that believes in itself, that is at the forefront of what's happening across all of America, that knows that 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 what happens here matters for the for the for the broader community, and and that is inevitably becoming the most ethnically diverse city in the country, and where the the the, the inequalities and divisions by ethnicity and and and, so, and class have to be bridged if we're going to build a viable society. And, and a model for the rest of the country. All right. I cannot thank you enough for joining us this evening, Dr. Kleinberg, for critical conversations here at HPL. You've been a great friend to the Houston Public Library, to the city of Houston. And on a personal note, you've been a great friend and mentor uh, and tutor for me all these years. Uh, our friendship grew into a relationship uh, that was developed on the principles that you and I hold dearly, relationships built on mutual trust and respect. Uh, and we've been able to run with that, capitalize on that, use that in so many ways, in so many things and projects and forums over the years. So I'm really grateful, grateful and humbled uh, to be able to say that uh, I really appreciate your friendship, concern uh, and love uh, over the years as we've gone forward uh, in this work. Let me end with a couple of thoughts. Uh, we can learn to live in the same community because at the end of the day, we will have similar, similar values. We do all want our children to be educated. We want them to go to college and do good in life. And we want the same for ourselves. That common denominator of wanting that education, something better for our children, should be one of the glue that holds us together. If we can just figure out how to capitalize on that. And I'll end on this note because I cannot end without saying this about Dr. Kleinberg. To be able to see beyond the world you're in, to imagine that something can be different, that is the job of a prophet. It is the rare prophet who not only imagines a new and different world, but also makes the new world a reality in his lifetime. He has given us the foundation. He's given us the predicate. He's given us the things we need to move this city forward. It is on us now. It is on us to make it happen, to take the action, to be committed, to be held accountable, to be transparent, to do those things that we have to do for the sake of all our children here in Houston, and so that they can be the type of citizens and human beings that we as a citizen need going forward. They're our future, our future workforce, our future everything. And we have to figure out a way to do right by all the children. Dr. Kleinberg has given us again that way to do that. I ask that we all rise to the occasion and search in deeper searching of the heart. We rise to play a greater part. That is our challenge to rise to play a greater part. We thank you for being with us this evening for critical conversations. We look forward to you joining us in future segments. Until then, as always, be well, stay safe and peace power. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Dr. Kleinberg.